What if everything you thought you knew about the pharaohs was wrong? For centuries, their golden masks, towering temples, and mysterious mummies have captivated the world. We've imagined them as god kings wrapped in mystery, their faces preserved for eternity beneath linen and resin. But now, for the first time in history, science has whispered back through the silence of 3,000 years. Ancient DNA has been pulled from their bones, and what it revealed is not what historians expected. Could the pharaoh's real faces tell a story the world was never meant to hear? When you think of ancient Egypt, whose face comes to mind? For many, it is the golden mask of Tutankhamun, the youthful boy king, radiant in hammered gold and lapis lazuli. Others imagine the stern, regal features of Ramses the Great, his statues carved into colossal rock faces, as though to defy time itself. These images have become icons, not just of a civilization, but of an idea. That the pharaohs were eternal, unchanged, godlike. For centuries, Egyptologists believed that their statues and tomb paintings represented reality, preserving their likenesses forever. But were these really their faces? Or were they masks hiding something else? As the 19th and 20th centuries unfolded, archaeologists uncovered mummy after mummy, row upon row of kings and queens in the Valley of the Kings. Their faces, desiccated and distorted, offered only partial answers. Some looked strangely European. Others bore features that seemed distinctly African. Still others were so damaged by time that no human features remained. And so the question grew louder. Who were the pharaohs, really? By the dawn of the 21st century, a new hope emerged. DNA analysis, the genetic code of life itself, offered a way to peer behind the mask of death. If we could sequence the genomes of the pharaohs, perhaps we could finally solve one of history's oldest mysteries. But there was a problem. Ancient DNA is fragile, easily destroyed by heat, humidity, and contamination. Egypt, with its hot deserts and millennia-old tombs raided by thieves, seemed like the worst place in the world to recover DNA for decades. Scientists said it was impossible. And then it happened. In 2010, a team led by Dr. Zahi Hawass announced the results of the first major genetic study of Egypt's royal mummies. They claimed to have extracted DNA from Tutankhamun and members of his family. The results shocked the world, revealing not just his parents, but his grandparents, his lineage, and the truth about his mysterious death. But there was one detail they kept quiet, one that only leaked later, and it sent shockwaves through the halls of academia. Tutankhamun, the golden boy king of Egypt, had DNA markers that seemed to link him more closely with populations outside of Africa, populations in the Near East and even Southern Europe. Some reports went so far as to claim he was genetically closer to Western Europeans than to modern Egyptians. The implication was explosive. Could the most iconic pharaoh in history have been less African than we thought? Was Egypt not the African civilization it had always been understood to be, but a Mediterranean or Middle Eastern outpost instead? Immediately, the controversy ignited. African historians pointed to the undeniable cultural and linguistic roots of Egypt in the Nile Valley. Anthropologists argued that art, religion, and even agriculture in Egypt bore the stamp of Africa. How could DNA suggest otherwise? European media outlets, meanwhile, seized on the leaks, publishing maps that seemed to claim Tutankhamun's closest genetic relatives lived not in Africa, but in Europe. Headlines screamed of white pharaohs, and suddenly Egypt's history was caught in the crossfire of identity politics. But was this really the truth? Or a manipulation of incomplete data? As more DNA tests trickled out in the years that followed, the picture became even murkier. Studies on mummies from Abusir el Melek, published in 2017, suggested that ancient Egyptians shared more ancestry with ancient Near Eastern populations than with modern Egyptians, who had more sub-Saharan African ancestry. But critics immediately attacked the study. 
The mummies tested were from a single site in Middle Egypt, dating to the late period, thousands of years after the golden age of the pharaohs. Could they really represent the entire civilization? And then came a deeper problem. DNA is not neutral. It can be interpreted or misinterpreted, depending on the political lens. Was Egypt being stripped of its African heritage to fit a Eurocentric narrative? Or was the science pointing to a more complex truth? That Egypt was never one thing, but always a crossroads. African, Asian, Mediterranean. All at once? To Tutankhamun, the boy king whose tomb captured the imagination of the world in 1922, became the first pharaoh to have his DNA mapped in detail. The results were both groundbreaking and disturbing. First, the team discovered that Tutankhamun's parents were not strangers, but siblings. His mother and father were brother and sister, a shocking revelation that explained his many health problems. Clubfoot, malaria, a cleft palate, weak bones, all symptoms of a royal bloodline that had been too tightly bound to the name of purity. But genetics revealed something else, something far more explosive. Tutankhamun carried genetic markers associated with haplogroup R1B1A2, a lineage most commonly found in Western Europe today. When Swiss researchers created a genetic profile based on the published data, they claimed that 70% of modern British men shared closer paternal ancestry with King Tut and modern Egyptians did. The claim was controversial, to say the least. Egypt's Supreme Council of Antiquities quickly pushed back, saying the data had been misinterpreted, misused, even weaponized. But the idea had already escaped into the wild, that the most famous pharaoh might not look the way many imagined. In 2014, using DNA CT scans and forensic reconstruction, scientists unveiled what they claimed to be the most accurate image of Tutankhamun ever produced and the world gasped. The face that emerged was not the golden ideal immortalized in his funerary mask. Instead, he was portrayed as a fragile, sickly young man with buck teeth, wide hips, and a clubfoot that left him unable to walk unaided. This image clashed violently with the powerful divine image of the pharaoh. Egypt had celebrated Tutankhamun as a golden god, yet here was a broken boy crippled by the very incest his family believed kept their bloodline pure. But was this really his face? Or just another mask, this time built by modern science? Tutankhamun was only the beginning. Other pharaohs were tested, their genetic codes partially mapped. Ramses III, one of Egypt's last great warrior kings, was confirmed through DNA testing to be the father of a young man whose throat had been slit a victim of palace intrigue during the uh, infamous harem conspiracy. DNA revealed not just a murder, but a dynasty unraveling. Other mummies hinted at genetic connections that stretched far beyond the Nile Valley. Some carried markers linking them to populations in the Levant, others to Nubia to the south. The picture that emerged was not of a single, isolated race of kings, but of a dynasty shaped by conquest trade, and migration. Yet, each revelation seemed to raise the same uncomfortable question. If Egypt's pharaohs were so genetically diverse, who had the right to claim them as their own? No sooner had these results been published than the battle for Egypt's identity exploded across the globe. European media seized on the results, running headlines that leaned heavily into the idea of white pharaohs or Near Eastern ancestry. Some outlets went further, publishing reconstructions that looked suspiciously European, fueling claims that Egypt was never truly African. Meanwhile, African scholars responded with fury. Egypt, they argued, had always been an African civilization at its core. Its agriculture, religion, language, and art all deeply rooted in the continent. To strip it of this heritage was not science, but politics. Modern Egyptians, too, felt caught in the crossfire. Many resented the idea that their ancestors were being portrayed as outsiders, stolen either by Europe or Africa 
in a battle over identity. And so, the pharaohs became not just relics of the past, but pawns in the wars of the present. The most dramatic moment came when scientists in 2022 unveiled facial reconstructions of three ancient Egyptian mummies based entirely on their DNA. These men lived more than 2,000 years ago, yet their faces were brought back to life with astonishing detail. The results stunned viewers. Their faces looked Mediterranean, lighter skin than modern Egyptians, with features more common to the Near East than to the Nile Valley. To some, this confirmed the theory that ancient Egyptians were closer to Levantine populations, but others called foul. These were late period mummies, not pharaohs of the Golden Age. Egypt had been conquered many times by then, by Libyans, Assyrians, Persians, Greeks, and Romans. How could these reconstructions represent the faces of the pharaohs who built the pyramids? Once again, the question of identity overshadowed the science. The deeper scientists dig into DNA, the more they uncover a troubling reality. DNA doesn't just reveal the past, it can be used to rewrite it. Ancient samples are rare, fragile, and often contaminated. Results can be skewed by modern handling, degraded by the passage of time, or misinterpreted through selective analysis. A single haplogroup marker can be blown into a headline that oversimplifies a complex story. And so, DNA becomes not just a tool of discovery, but a weapon of narrative. Who gets to decide what the pharaohs looked like? The scientists extracting fragile strands of DNA, the historians interpreting the results? The media spinning headlines? Or the cultures today that claim Egypt as part of their heritage? To truly understand the pharaoh's DNA, we must remember what Egypt was. Not just a kingdom along the Nile, but a bridge between worlds. Egypt sat at the meeting point of Africa and Asia, bordered by the Mediterranean to the north and Nubia to the south. For thousands of years, it was the hub of trade routes that carried ivory, gold, spices, incense, and people. Traders, migrants, and conquerors passed through its borders constantly. The pharaohs themselves were not immune to this movement. Some dynasties were deeply Nubian, with kings from Kush who ruled Egypt and even expanded its borders. Others intermarried with princesses from the Levant, cementing alliances with Canaan and Syria. Later dynasties bore the stamp of Libyan generals, Assyrian invaders, and Persian rulers. In this sense, the pharaohs were not a single lineage, but a tapestry, a dynasty shaped by centuries of migration and power struggles. So when DNA reveals connections to Africa, Asia, and even Europe, should we really be surprised? Or should we see it as evidence that Egypt was always larger than any single identity, a living crossroads of the ancient world? But there is one chapter often left out of the DNA debate, the Nubian pharaohs of the 25th dynasty. These rulers, hailing from the kingdom of Kush in what is today Sudan, conquered Egypt in the 8th century BCE and ruled as pharaohs for nearly a century. They saw themselves not as foreigners, but as restorers of Egypt's ancient traditions. They built temples, revived old religious practices, and styled themselves as the heirs of the great kings of the past. Their DNA, if fully sequenced, would almost certainly show stronger ties to sub-Saharan Africa. Yet they are rarely included in the genetic debate, overshadowed by the more famous mummies of the New Kingdom. Why? Perhaps because their story complicates the neat narratives. If pharaohs could be African, Asian, and Mediterranean at different points in time, then Egypt cannot be claimed by any single group. It belongs to all and to none. Ancient records reveal that Egyptian merchants sailed the Red Sea, trading with the mysterious land of Punt, a kingdom whose people may have lived in modern Somalia or Eritrea. Others marched north into the Levant, where Egypt's armies left behind stele and inscriptions. Still others campaigned deep into Nubia, integrating its culture into their own. And so the DNA makes sense. Traces of Africa, traces of Asia, 
traces of the Mediterranean. Egypt was never isolated. It was global before globalization, connected before the modern world ever existed. But here lies the uncomfortable truth. DNA confirms what history already showed us. Egypt was not a sealed kingdom of a single people, but a flowing river of cultures, always shifting, always blending. And yet, why does this truth frighten us so much? Because history is not just about the past, it is about power in the present. Every group wants to claim Egypt. For Africans, it is proof of an ancient, sophisticated civilization born on their soil. For Europeans, it is evidence of ties to the Mediterranean world and classical heritage. For modern Egyptians, it is a direct link to national identity. So when DNA studies suggest one connection or another, they are not read as neutral science. They are read as weapons in a cultural war. This is why some results are celebrated, others buried, and many hotly contested. It is not just about what the DNA says, but who controls the story. And here lies the danger. If the Pharaoh's DNA can be used to divide us today, then perhaps we are missing the real lesson of their lives. That civilization flourishes not in isolation, but in connection. But there is still one final layer to this story. Many of Egypt's greatest pharaohs have never been genetically tested. For one simple reason, their tombs remain lost. The burial place of Alexander the Great, who ruled Egypt as pharaoh, has never been found. The tomb of Cleopatra and Mark Antony, the last rulers of Ptolemaic Egypt, is still a mystery. Even some native Egyptian dynasties remain buried beneath the sands, undiscovered. What secrets lie in those untouched tombs? What DNA lingers in their bones, waiting to be sequenced? Could a single discovery silence the debate, or ignite it like never before? Imagine for a moment, if the DNA of Ramses the Great were fully sequenced tomorrow. Would his genome confirm him as an African king? A Mediterranean ruler? Or something entirely unexpected? The answer could rewrite history in an instant. So, what did ancient DNA really reveal about the pharaohs? That they were not one thing, but many. That their faces were not eternal masks, but shifting reflections of a kingdom at the crossroads of the world. That the pharaohs cannot be claimed by one people, one race, or one continent. They were African. They were Mediterranean. They were Levantin. They were all of these and more. And perhaps this is the truest revelation of all. The pharaohs were not gods because they were pure. They were gods because they embodied the connections of the world itself. But even now, the greatest mystery remains unsolved. For if DNA can reveal so much from bones 3,000 years old, what might it tell us about the secrets still buried beneath the sands? What if the next tomb we open contains a pharaoh whose DNA changes everything we thought we knew, not just about Egypt, but about the origins of civilization itself? The story of the pharaohs is not finished. Their mummies still wait in silence. Their genomes still whisper in code. And the question remains, when we finally uncover the last pharaoh's face, will we recognize him at all? This has been Whispers of the Past. If you want more forgotten mysteries, hidden truths, and history's most forbidden stories, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Because the past is never truly silent. It only waits for someone to listen.